Hello everyone, welcome to today's show. And if you are joining for the first time, this is part of our digital transformation series for which we meet every Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we pick one topic related to digital transformation for today. We are talking about KPIs for production managers. So we are going to live in the world of manufacturing a lot. I don't know if anybody, any other industries are going to have production, but we'll find out. Uh, before we do that, we are going to start with everybody's intros. I am going to start with my intro. If you don't know me, Sam Gupta, principal at Elevate IQ. Elevate IQ is the independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm. On that note, I am going to move to Chris for his intro. Thanks, Sam. Chris Ghiardini, president and owner of Turnkey Technologies. So I've been in the ERP industry for about 35 years. Again, we focus on the Microsoft Dynamics platform. 56% of our clients are manufacturing, so lots of KPIs. Glad to be here. Thank you. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Chris. Abu, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Sure. Thanks, Sam. Uh, my name is Abu, and I'm founder and president at Panny Management Tech Corp. So we are Sage X3 uh, partner for the last uh, 12, uh, 12 years, and you know we so a lot of manufacturing industry, from chemicals to food to just general equipment manufacturing. So excited to be on this panel. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Abu. And today, guys, I'm going clockwise, so I have to skip myself, and I'm moving to Paul. Paul, would you like to introduce yourself? Okay. <laughs> Paul, go ahead. Did we lose Paul? Paul Vrabel on vital process and operating change and uh, buy into change in a day, implementation, and rapid achievement of results. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much uh, for being here, Paul. And Paul, you may want to turn off your video. Uh, I think you did the smart thing uh, because the internet does not seem to be great. Um, on that note, thank you so much for being here. Mike, uh, do you want to introduce yourself next? Yeah, thanks, Sam, for having me back again. Uh, my name is Mike Schlagenhoff. I've been in manufacturing since 1979, so that's uh, 44 years this September. Uh, currently, I work as a manufacturing consultant for uh, an insurance carrier. Uh, we, we protect about 7,700 manufacturing, and my role is go in there and help them make their business better. And you ask them what they measure and their KPIs, and they give you the deal on the headlight look, and you know you have a lot of work cut out for you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it definitely is. Thank you so much for being here, Mike. And I have stopped mentioning how long I have been in the industry because it's almost embarrassing when I say 20 years. It's almost, <laughs> it sounds like rookie. Um, <laughs> Dave, do you want to introduce yourself next? <laughs> yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Griffith. I run a company called Kaplan Solutions. Uh, I, I will not talk about how long I've been in the industry for similar reasons uh, to Sam. Uh, we help companies, most almost exclusively manufacturing and industrial companies, uh, go and understand the operational technology and the people, the people part of the process to find breakthrough results quickly. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Dave. Um, so Chris, today we are talking about production managers. So obviously, we definitely want to talk about if you have seen production managers anywhere else. I know production could mean a lot of different things. And I have seen even the software companies using the term production because obviously they manufacture as well. Not sure if they go through the same manufacturing process, but some people might, uh, you know, perceive that as production as well. So maybe, you know, we want to talk about different um, industries. Nomenclature. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Let's set the stage. Let's set the context. And then let's talk about KPI. So Chris. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's a great point. I had a guy today goes, you have experience in construction. I go, you mean making things? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, did I just oversimplify the term construction? And for anybody yeah. in the construction industry, we make things. We, yeah. we manufacture, we make things. When we do professional services, we make things. Even in IT, we make things. So so production is a great term. It is a little more general, but think about it. Is manufacturing and production the same? 
subset, superset. Anyway, in the end of the day, you know, the, the, the concept of making things, right? And I think that as we look at what do we measure, and I came up with the macro terms, and I'm like, all right, we're always measuring efficiencies, accuracy, throughput, output, throughput. I don't know if they're the same, uh, capacity, variance. Those are the things we're always, okay, and where do we want to measure each of those in different categories? And, you know, in in volume, maybe volume's another one that I put in there because if, if I'm the manufacturer is, but again, let, let's pick a couple. And, um, you know, manufacturing, let's talk about production manufacturing, but in, even in any production, what's my capacity? And, and the question is, is you look at how do I measure capacity? And, 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 you know, again, the other, the other part of what we're measuring is demand and, okay, demand and capacity. And if this much capacity, how long does it take to deliver the demand? Okay. And, and so there's, then I'm going to focus on that little group right there because it's, it's huge. And, you know, companies are like, okay, well, what's capacity? Well, is it based on machines? Is it based on machines and people? Is it based on machines and people and, you know, available inventory in the next seven days? So as you think about defining capacity, it varies because in, in, in my world, professional services, we don't have equipment, we have people. Okay, but each people, each person, people <laughs> has an efficiency on it. So now we're adding efficiency to the capacity calculation because that machine has an 80% efficiency. Well, that worker has got a 43% efficiency, whatever you want to call it. So capacity, efficiency, people, equipment. But again, in the end of the day, how does capacity define what? It defines, okay, a units. How many units can I make? Does it define my profit per hour? Ooh, well, that's an important one. Can I turn around and sort that by the stuff I'm making and the highest profit per hour? So now you've got a huge return on effort. But again, we're still talking about capacity. So measuring capacity demand and, and where are the variables? Well, how do I increase capacity? So meaning if demand increases and I'm the planner and I'm looking at, well, now my delivery cycle, I'm now, takes me 10 weeks to deliver. Okay, I got to be at six. We don't want to, get rid of demand so we have to manage capacity so how do i manage capacity back to machines people oh i'm gonna add a shift i'm gonna add two hours everybody's gonna work from eight to ten so again even in in this little model here and i've got an analytics and so we've got current state now what some of the stuff i'm talking about is simulation i had that term come up today for a project we're going to do and they're like can you run simulations on master planning this is what ifs what if i have to make 50 drones and i have nine months how much capacity do i need can you imagine the system say, well, you need 73 people, you need 14 more work centers, you need to work a 14 hour shift, six days a week. Okay, that's a simulation. So current state, capacity, and again, in the operation guy, he's trying to manage to that. And what's the variance? Well, I'm not at capacity. I'm missing my, my capacity. What's How much room do I have to sell more stuff? So again, I can talk a lot right in this little sphere. Um, I try to stay off the other topic, topics, gents, because I always cover too much turf, but um, I'll leave it at that for starters. Yeah, so amazing start. And by the way, my uh, clockwise uh, simulation model is not going to work just because Paul disappeared and came back. Uh, but maybe I still have the clockwise. <laughs> by the way, Chris, uh, on construction, you know, if you're going to say you make things and you are fired because they don't make things, they construct. <laughs> you know, it's all semantics. It's terminology. I know, I know, I know right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings either, right? So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I mean, honestly speaking, I mean, when I look at, and some of the, you're absolutely right, if you look at some of the construction verticals, I mean, they are kind of manufacturing, but they are not manufacturing because they do accounting differently. Um, so it's kind of different. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I get your uh, point. Um, and Dave is going to be so mad today, okay? Uh, because we mixed up Output and throughput, and I'm pretty sure Dave is going to handle this. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't define it. I didn't go there. Anyway. Um, so the follow-up question I'm going to have for you, Chris, is, I don't know, let me see if you want to touch a little bit more uh, on the KPIs. I know you talked about a lot of different KPIs um, sure. in terms of capacity and demand and how you are doing the scenario building, but you know, for the production managers, let's say they are starting for the first time, which are some of the KPIs that they sure. should be paying attention it, it to? Just, let's just start with the basic capacity, right? If I'm if I'm living on work centers and I have one operator per work center and my world is defined based on work centers and uptime and efficiency, then we start with 
the Excel sheet and we start looking at, okay, let's get every work center in there. And there's some components as to what kind of jobs. And then there's some, some analysis of job loading, but certainly you're looking at the capacities. If you're running an eight hour shift, machine it's a simple metric it's hours machines you may program in some maintenance component there to kind of come up with a macro capacity that's the beginning step it's it's remedial but that's the crawl walk run but you start with basic capacity now now i've got an operator who can run two machines okay all right you were adding complexity but again you start basic we're looking at work centers we're looking at hours and that in essence for most manufacturers that are grinding stuff out their machines define how much they can produce effectively unless they're having labor so again you start there and then do we have people-based work centers we've just kind of continued to expand capacity so i manage capacity for an erp practice the same way it's a list of people and it's a matrix of skills and clients and projects and we're looking at what's the macro capacity and then as you labor load in what's the available capacity but that's the starting points for a, a production person it's just and again what's he trying to do a week out i want to make sure i maximize my utilization of that capacity so um, but that's the basic KPI. Yeah. Amazing insights here. Thank you so much, Chris, for that. Um, so, Abu, I'm coming over to you. And um, I know um, in some of the previous sessions when uh, Chris uh, used to talk and he had a story related to pigs, uh, I don't know whether you guys remember or not. Okay, And, and he actually spoke about manufacturing there. Okay, <laughs> So that was a real manufacturing. <laughs> So you work in um, the agriculture space. Now, agriculture space could be very tricky as well, right? Agriculture, food and beverage. So I don't know whether you are going to call that manufacturing because even agriculture could be called as manufacturing. So I don't know where you draw the lines. Uh, Abu, over to you, um, you know, what you have seen from the production perspective. I, th I think if you're making something that's manufacturing, right? I mean, even construction is, uh, is project manufacturing, right? You're doing a specific make to order. Uh, construction right so so it does take a lot of elements uh, from everything right even in the agriculture space uh it's again it's manufacturing you're growing something right it's a it's a different processes and methods around it but ultimately you have raw material which is the seed and you are doing a lot of activities uh you know you're feeding it you're fertilizing it uh you're putting in nutrients you're trimming you're pruning you're doing all of that and then you're doing a lot of labor operation and you have a final product at the end uh, the way the steps that are involved in it probably are a bit different than you know your standard uh, you know typical manufacturing, but there's also a lot of similarities um, you know from a manufacturing perspective, and they do borrow a lot of those uh, similar concepts, you know, similar you know, but you know more focused on the industrial niches, for example. Um, but but they are you know, similar in some aspects for sure. To be called you know generally manufacturing, right? So, uh, that's my opinion on it. So. From a from a KPI perspective, I think it's uh, you know everything varies. Like I mean, um, it varies by the industry, but I think some of them are fairly common, unique across the uh, like fairly common across the industry. Like cost per piece or cost per, uh, especially where you're making something like units rather than you're doing um, you know like engineered water or construction kind of projects. If you're making individual units whether it's agriculture or whether it's, uh, you know, industrial equipment or something else, you know, cost would be uh, one key component, right? You pay the production manager, making sure that, that you're on top of your costs. Uh, other factors uh, which, are, which are different, like the food and beverage yield is a very uh, important KPI uh, that manufacturers track. You know, you had, you're using 100 kilograms of peanuts, how much peanut bars did you make at the end, right? So their wastage uh, is a big thing, um, right? So if you're wasting 10% of your raw material of your food product, uh, that's a big cost that you can drive down and reduce. Uh, similarly, it also applies in um, you know in the steel industry, for example, right? Where they're cutting steel, um, steel plates, and so on. Again, yield uh, become very important over there as well. You know, you have all softwares which would optimize plate cutting and all of that for you, right? Uh, so yield and wastage uh, would be two important uh, KPIs. Chris talked a lot about capacity. So I think that again, uh, how much idle time you have, like if you have, uh, are your work center like peat where you cannot, you do not have enough to produce, but now they also idle a lot of time, right? So what's the, what's the utilization rate of the work centers? Uh, what's the, um, 
you know, are you becoming short on orders? Are you not able to manufacture when you need them? And then you're hitting peaks. So all of those factors from a production uh, perspective would be uh, important in my, in my view. Yeah, very interesting insights. And when you say, you know, everything is manufacturing, that reminds me of uh, the Workday ad. I don't know whether you guys have seen that or not. Uh, the Rockstar one. Okay, so in that, they have these HR guys and they are talking about how everybody is a rock star. But yeah. then when there is going to be a real rock star, they sort of struggle uh, <laughs> calling them a rock star. Okay, um, so that's what you are doing here, right? I mean, see, if everything is manufacturing, sometimes that could get very typical, right? I'm going to claim that this is also manufacturing whatever I'm doing here. Event could be manufacturing, but not only exactly. this is not manufacturing. I mean, at a high level, right? I mean, then you get into those niches, and then everything becomes different, right? Uh, but at a very high level, even IT is manufacturing, right? You're doing an IT product, you're doing an implementation. It's still, you know, what Chris said, you know, you're utilizing your resources, project planning, cost, everything, right? So, yeah, could not agree more. And I think Dave is going to say that's how accountants are going to think. For them, everything is manufacturing, but everything is not manufacturing. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, good insight, Abu. So I'm coming over to you, Paul. Uh, you know, and from your experience, whatever KPIs you have seen uh, working for the production managers, if you want to talk about that, Paul. So I mean, there's there's a okay, a, a kind of a standard list. What's your What's your production volume? Uh, what are you doing in terms of uh, quality performance? You certainly want to see that. Uh, a lot of people, they look at uh, internal quality me metrics, and somehow that uh, the customer metrics don't make it back in. So uh, looking at uh, PPMs that the in automotive, for example, that the customer is seeing, uh, those those need to be part of that uh, production manager's information, uh, part of the metrics. Waste and scrap, of course. Uh, a lot of things related to employees. Uh, absenteeism and cross-training and uh, retirements, new hires, uh, maintenance, what's, what's planned, what's unplanned. Uh, and uh, what, are, what are you actually tracking there? Where's that information coming from? Uh, so a lot of that information might be uh, somebody, somebody sitting there with, a, with a, uh, some electronic system tracking things, and they're not really getting the true story, which is known by the operator who's on the machine and who knows this is what happened at that point. So. Uh, KPIs, you can also get into some some uh, uh, complications and demotivating behaviors based on the KPIs that you're uh, that you're setting up. But the operators don't see that 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 is realistic. Uh, then then you end up with uh, one of these uh, daily huddles, and everybody's looking around at each other and saying. Well, that, that data doesn't really reflect what <laughs> what what we see here. <laughs> so, uh, but maybe the system is set up so that somebody is getting paid based on that metric, and then system distorts itself to uh, maximize that metric uh, at the expense of of others. Uh, certainly, waste and scrap are important metrics. And uh, inventory levels, uh, especially in terms of production, I mean, making things, uh, anything related to stockouts or uh, material in stock that's uh, past whatever, whatever validity, validity dates that it has, especially in, for instance, chemical manufacturing. Um, so those are all, uh, those are all metrics that I think are, I mean, it's a whole, as, uh, as Chris has said, it's a whole soup. <laughs> it's a whole soup of things. And which of those metrics are going to dominate depends on the, the characteristics of your business. 
Yeah, could not agree more, Paul. And uh, honestly speaking, I think in my experience, the biggest challenge, and you guys can tell me whether you guys agree with me on this point or not. Um, the biggest challenge for production managers is always going to be that human input anytime because you are running very, very, very expensive machines. Um, you are trying to maintain the production schedule. Uh, in our industry, typically, you know, we don't have problem of absenteeism. Uh, but you mentioned that in manufacturing, that is definitely going to be there. In our case, I mean, when we are going to have predictable vacations, I know Chris does not like it. Okay, he's always thinking that these guys are always off. I don't know when they work. Uh, and I'm actually trying to manage <laughs> project here and I, I just cannot do that. Okay, so it's very, very, very hard. And when you are going to have absent absenteeism, <laughs> I don't know how you manage that, to be honest. Uh, personally, I struggle a lot and I end up working a lot more for my employees in general. That's how it goes. Uh, so I don't know, Paul, what you have seen in terms of how you manage um, the employee related KPIs. Well, the, I'll, I mean, I'll give I'll give an example. Came into a, came into a company, and uh, they had a they, they had a, just an abysmal, chronic ab absenteeism issue. Uh, part of that was driven by a uh, command and control structure. So, if something happened their first response was who did it now let's find them and let's train them and fix them i mean that was their that literally was their their response and uh it, it was a business that uh depended on teams working together and the teams had their own kind of individual uh codes for doing things well, you take one person out of that team, you put another person in, and instead of chronic absent, or in addition to chronic absenteeism, you you have chronic non-conforming delivery of parts because the the the, the information transfer isn't there. Um, so the, the the answer to that was they did it very very badly. I mean, it, they they didn't have that, and what we had to do was actually changed the whole system, uh, the whole management system. So we started by, let's go right after understanding what the real process is, as opposed to let's let's find, fa find fault and you know, crucify the people who, are, who did something. Um, and that change, working with the employees and listening to the issues that they had, uh, how things actually worked, and then fixing as we as we went, uh, literally changed the work environment so that people who would who would ordinarily have called and said, "Oh, you know, my car didn't start today. I don't think I'm going to come." Uh, they they ended up with record numbers of perfect attendance awards. So I guess the short answer is fix the system in which people work, create an environment that is safe for change and that people are improvement seeking. So you've, you've changed the whole motivation of the workforce. Um, I, I came in uh, about two months after we finished this engagement and, and people were literally grabbing me and showing what they had done because the new the new order of things was what's the process there? How does it work? Do we understand that? And and all the things that derived from that. And the last thing on the list was somebody made a mistake or didn't didn't you know they did they didn't get trained. Um, so that that personnel issue, as you rightly point out, was just it was absolutely right at the core of the productivity and the accuracy of the company of what they were delivering to the customers yeah could not agree more thank you so much paul for that so mike i'm coming over to you and i don't know what your style is to be honest in terms of managing my style always is going to be command and control and crucifying that's far more fun than anything else right uh, <laughs> 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 but in terms of kpis mike 
you know, and I know that, I mean, we have discussed a lot of different KPIs, but I don't know if people really understand what they each mean and what is going to be the impact of each of those. So maybe pick some of them and describe what they really mean, how they impact different industries. Mike, over to you. So, so as a production manager, I think you need to identify who your customers, because, you know, depending on your organization, do I directly deal with the end user or not, right? But I think uh, uh, Paul mentioned that on, 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 on Chris. So my quality manager or my quality department is a custom of me because I, I have to make good widgets, right? So first I would start with identify who are your customers, right? And then one of the metrics is I think that's very valuable is, and I think Chris touched on this, your product per labor hour, right? Because, you know, you can hire 100 people to make this and uh, six months later, you're out of business. So you need to understand what, what, who your customer is and then what are they looking for? Do they looking for quality parts? Your master scheduler really doesn't care your quality part. He's more interested as the product make it to, to, the, to the end user, right? Um, your, your inventory manager uh, is more concerned about do I have enough here to make the shipment tomorrow, right? So everybody has, <clears throat> excuse me, everybody has different demands. So as a production manager, I think you're in the middle. You know, last week we talked about the operations manager. He's probably your boss, right? So what do those people want and how do I get it there? And I think one of the, the key things to understand is that, I hate to say this, but production makes less money, right? Yes, in, engineers in the office, they don't add any money. So that, that indicator of, of, of value added per labor hour or product per labor hour, how do I turn the inputs that uh, Chris talked about? How do I talk the raw material, my machine capacity, and my human, human efforts, labor force, into the product to add value to it? And that's a pretty tough one to, to put uh, metrics in there on, on KPIs because, you know, you said... Uh, if you have a disgruntled workforce that Paul just mentioned, yeah, we made 100 widgets, but 50 of them we have to throw away, right? So now your inputs and your outputs are impacted by that. Plus, you have a, 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 a workforce that is very negative and probably not open to, to changes or to help you to win the daily battle. So you asked before, you said you like the control and command uh, leadership style, right? Uh, I, I come out of the lean manufacturing. I believe in a, in a culture and a company of employee empowerment. That doesn't mean we give the keys of the, of the uh, insane asylum to the insane asylum people, right? That's not what that means. But that means is, you know, for example, a simple tool like the Gemba Walk, I think it was mentioned here by go out, find out what it is. Yeah, the data says we have a deficiency in this, in this work center. And Jim told me this, you know, the old telephone, we whisper everything in the ear by the time it gets to me, it's, oh, it's, it's four o'clock, it's go home time, right? So I think tools like, simple tools like this and have the people empowered, you know, the open door policy, we hear it, but, you know, seriously, I think my door at my last manufacturing job was never closed. I think it, the, the hinges rusted shut in the open. Have them come in, sit down. What's the problem? Go out there, see there for yourself. And then based on this, involve the people to solve the problem. I think Paul said that when he came in two months later, they all showed them what they did, how they accomplished it. And I think if you create an environment like this, you have a, a, a teamwork that's pushing for the same goals. Now, as a production manager, to direct all of those people, I think, to those KPIs, to those goals, because before I said the quality guy wants 99.9% .9 first time pass rate. The inventory manager wants 100% uh, 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 on, time, on time delivery. And your boss wants 27% uh, uh, profitability, right? So you need to figure this out to get this together. And I think a lot of times what we're looking in there that people attack only one of those things, you know, they leave the human factor over here and the equipment factor over here, and they don't combine that and they have a two, fo two forces fighting each other. Does, does that kind of make sense when you, you, you ask me? By the way, I do have a whip in my office, so I do like <laughs> control and command too. So. <laughs> By the way, Mike, do you want to know how to create a dis disgruntled worker? Yeah. Uh, you know, we have a production manager sitting right here in the room, and you are talking about operations manager being the boss of the production manager. And I know Dave is going to be so mad, he's probably going to throw a manufacturing granite today, okay? Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know what? The question I'm going to have for you is, obviously, when you get into these conflicts, I know that 
Paul probably spoke about the costing, the interaction between different parties. Uh, costing is obviously going to be very important. But when you look at cost, okay, cost goes through a lot of different layers. It has to go through a lot of different departments. And when your, let's say, operations manager or the inventory manager is not going to be happy with you, the numbers are going to be all over the place, I guess. I, <laughs> so you really need to know how to work with them, I guess, right? Uh, otherwise, your KPIs are going to be all over the place. So I don't know if you have any other insights in terms of the KPIs that are going to be slightly more cross functional for production managers. Mike, to me, you, I, I mentioned that before. I think that the value add, and you can do this in different ways, is you know, input in at, at the dollar value. We took six bolts, four pounds of steel, uh, machine time, cost this and this. So I added labor cost. I added you know, we call it burden rate. That goes all into those those fixed costs that I even my engineers that that don't add value to the product because they don't produce anything. That goes in. So I have all of those costs coming in, and then I target the CFO's target of profitability. And to to match that, I think you need like like you said, you need to understand those inputs, and you need to literally go out when you, when you when you have those inputs. And how do they impact? And, and that's where the, I think the production manager and the operations manager work hand in hand, even if he's my boss, because I used to be a production man and I became an operations man. I think they need to really understand each other, the language that they're speaking, because if he speaks this and I interpret this, this production and operations is not going to work together. So to answer, I think one of the key things is, is and, and, and we talked about this before, throughput and inputs and all of this. I think the, the easiest way to, to explain that is you need to put production, this is a struggle a little bit here, but you need to put production in the center of the operations because all the other inputs, you know, quality which controls me, but they need to be part of the solution. So just rejecting my parts doesn't work. They need to be part of this and say, hey, we're finding out work center six has an issue. Work center seven, which does the same operation, doesn't have that issue. So they need to help me to break those uh, deltas between my KPIs down and bring me the information back and say, hey, every time second shift comes in, your output goes up, but your quality goes down. We can provide that data. We can analyze that for you. And then it's my job as the production manager to put the right resources on, on the departments together to, you know, when I was a lean, lean, uh, a lean uh, implementation manager, one of the things we measured is ideas, improvement ideas per employee. So that's why I go back to the cu culture that you have is make the people part of the solution. And I think Paul said that coming back two months later and he has all friends suddenly because when he walked in first, they didn't like him because they thought uh, he's going to cut all our chops, right? But then he came in back two months later. So to me, <clears throat> I think production managers, it's not just a technical job. It's a very people-oriented job. You need to know what, trick, what makes your people trigger to do what you need them to do without using the whip, right? So... Could not agree more. Thank you so much, Mike, for that. Yep. Um, and Dave, I don't know how you are feeling at this point of time. Uh, Mike did try to make up towards the end because he did say that uh, production needs to be at the center of everything, right? So, I, but <laughs> in the beginning, he did say that he had a whip, right? Uh, so I don't know how you are feeling at this point of time and with whip, uh, you know, how you are going to feel overall about the APIs because <laughs> you are probably not going to care for any of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Sam, one thing I can tell you is I basically blacked out right after the point that Mike said uh, he's a people centric uh, leader, but he's also got a whip. And then between you and Chris, <laughs> you and Chris and Mike, I don't really know what happened for the for the last five minutes of my life. Um, but what I would agree um, with Mike, with Paul, with everyone is that a production manager is probably like 50 percent therapist and probably like 50 percent machine whisperer. Right. Like if you are going going to go run production in a manufacturing facility, you have to understand people, you have to make sure that you can have properly trained people, however we want to train them. And I feel like we could have a more than 60 minute debate upon the, the correct way to train them. But we have to have properly trained people with some amount of experience to regularly show up for their shifts in order to go run machines that are hopefully well taken care of and have, we have the product that we need to go run what, what is scheduled. So I would say that a production manager, especially if they're running just production and they're running three to five shifts and they don't own operations and maybe they don't own the 
the entire facility is probably one of the most stressful jobs because they're, they're not human resources, but they are in the middle of trying to make sure everyone shows up on time. And we had talked about what happens when people don't show up with truancy and whatnot. I would say in some of the best organizations I've worked with, we assume that there is some number of people who aren't going to show up and we've got extra people scheduled in a more realistic good opportunity. We know some people aren't gonna show up, so we've got two or three floaters maybe in management, maybe in a, a leadership role who are regularly going to go out and, and work the line or the lines because that, that's where they've come through. Um, and in a lot of other instances, we've got a production manager or a general manager or someone who's gotta go help go run whatever we're running through the line because we are missing two or three or five people and we're going to go run around the whole shift and, and try to keep the, the line or try to keep the work cells up and running. Uh, I, I would say kind of beyond that, I, I, th I want to thank Chris and, and Abu, right? So, so Chris was talking about how construction is manufacturing um, and Abu was talking about how, how big ag was manufacturing. And guys, like, like there was a period of time in my life where I struggled defining the, the difference between manufacturing and other industrial applications. I, I think that this is my example. Like, like forevermore, I now have a clear delineation of, of manufacturing and other industrial applications. And for probably 80 plus percent of what we're talking about, the processes are all the same. Um, in, in many instances, though, um, I don't know any large, big ag or, or construction company who would really like to hear that they're the same as the, the manufacturing company, uh, the, the manufacturing company down the road. So, so thank you guys for that. That is a story that I will probably get a thousand laughs at uh, over the course of the next six months. Uh, but but go, going back to, to some of the KPIs, right? I think that, that it's important to drill down on KPIs and and I think it's important to talk about how large the organization is. And I think Chris brought up a really good point, right? So he's talking about simulation and, and I, I love simulation. Um, and, and simulation is, hey, I need to go make 500 of these these work cell widgets over the course of the next six months. How do I do it? Um, what, what I've learned living in that production role is it's not a linear scalability, right? If, if I've got five people working, I can't go at 10 people and assume we're going to go double what, what our, our output or throughput. And we, we won't get into the debate of output versus throughput. I, I would hope in this instance, they're the same thing. Um, I worked with a company uh, a year or a couple of years ago who, before I got there, they're like, hey, we're running 10,000 widgets a month. 10,000 widgets a month is really good. We would like. Um, Dave, do we is not linear uh, when it comes to that, but I, I think I froze out. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, now you are back, I guess. Okay. Uh, Dave, yeah, okay. go, on, go on, please. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so I was saying scalability is not linear. So, as I look at kind of top KPIs for, um, as I look at top KPIs for production managers, I, I like throughput. Um, right. So, so throughput generally lets us know how much we're running through. Hopefully, if that throughput comes down, we'll know that we'll have yield quality or, or production or other issues. I would say as well, kind of downtime. Right. So we know based upon throughput and what our downtime or perhaps OEE looks like generally how we're running. We know if we're taking lots of downtime, like hopefully we will have an operator code of, hey, we did not have enough people to go run this shift. And that can lead us back to truancy. That can lead us back to, hey, we've, we've got a bunch of quality problems. And th then I like looking at orders chipped versus expected orders. Right. So, so we, we know what was on track and then that can lead back to, hey, can we run the production schedule that we're looking for? Um, do we have the the raw materials in do we have the orders and if i had to pick three i would say that those those three are, are three of of my favorite to look at and hopefully we're able to, to go correlate kind of the the human aspect the machine aspect and everything else based upon those okay amazing insights there thank you so much uh Dave, for that so chris i'm coming over to you and today internet is acting like our attention spans sometimes we have sometimes we don't uh <laughs> Um, so for you, I guess, I mean, since we have just what now, 20 minutes, we'll probably move quickly. Um, and uh, you are touching on any specific KPIs that you want to pick on. Uh, and I don't know, again, the goal here is going to be, I know we have mentioned a lot of them, but I don't know if all production managers are really going to 
understand what they mean, the how they really behind practice. them. Sure. Exactly. Sure. So describe so some we'll maybe use, story we'll or we'll examples. Use a, we'll use an example. And let's talk about labor variance. Okay. Yeah. And so what that means is is where we have bill of materials and we define a routing and we have operations and each operation has a standard labor rate on it. That operation is two hours. Great. The guys over there clocking labor variance where we're looking at on a production order, we do micro macro micro means I'm looking at the variance on one single production order. Macro means I'm looking at the variance for the period overall production orders, for example. So, and at the top level, you may say, oh, there's no variance. But at a micro level, we may say, oh, well, we've got positives and negatives. And so, but variance, again, is if the if the standard is two hours, it took him three and a half. Why? And so the analytics, the, the business intelligence, the KPIs, key performance indicators, you want to see that variance and say, what happened on this particular manufacturing order? And, and again, there's the example of the variance on labor, um, standard labor. And, and why is that a problem? Well, because the product costs more now. And again, the guy priced it with an assumption. So again, all of a sudden I got more costs. That's a problem because the sales guys are going to say, what happened to my margin? I thought I had 30%. I have 2%. Well, my guys are working slow. And again, real labor. Okay. So that's, that's a great example. Material variance. I'll just stay in that same area. Material variance is another one where, you know, depending on the type of production or manufacturing you're doing, or construction. Maybe you don't break things. Maybe you don't have defects, but that material variance is again, it says I need one. I use three of them. Big spike in the curve where now my material cost is 300% of expected. Why? And so again, as we're looking at variances, we've got standards and in most stuff, it's pretty, some companies they'll back flush most of the components. Why? Because eh, I don't need to count it. I know I use one. They never break. They're always good, but there may be other products where and, and this this probably comes into an efficiency component as well as you look at material variance and depending on your manufacturing, I had a client that did glass. So they extruded glass for IV bottles, real little teeny, teeny, you know how fragile? Well, they had a 250% efficiency. I mean, that means they destroy, they have to use two and a half pounds to make one pound of good. So again, there's a perfect example where, you know, what's that variance on that material consumption? Because in the end of the day, the price assumes a certain... <laughs> material cost and again that variance so those are two real examples where we're measuring what's the standard what did i actually use macro micro again at a macro level if we don't have good systems technology you're counting inventory in the end of the month you're like hey we're missing a bunch of stuff well most manufacturing systems allow you to issue additional inventory it puts more cost into work and process so anyway there are a couple of good examples yeah, great examples. And I'm going to have just one follow-up question for you, um, Chris, and that is going to be back flushing. I don't know, you know, whose back I'd be flushing. Uh <laughs> so so back flushing is a is a technique in, in in production and manufacturing environments. When we define our bill of materials, there are certain products where we could say, Oh, I know I'm gonna use that exactly. And I can consume those either at the beginning of the process or the end of the process. It really depends on when you want to see it leave inventory because even even at the end of the process it's allocated it's not available so back flush means you you consume the standard quantity you don't have an operator collecting data um, but you can mix which means in a single bill of material maybe nine of my ten components i back flush them but this tenth one it's gold bullion which means we're going to get real precise or maybe it's a very expensive chemical. I've got an example of a guy that was grinding body parts out of a piece of plastic. One inch was five thousand dollars in plastic so they're very very meticulous about measuring grams of that plastic because it can dramatically change the cost of the product but there's the example on back flushing it means i don't count it when i consume it when i issue it i'm literally counting it did i need to issue more what happened i spilled it it was a defect there's a lot of reasons you may have to go back to the mill and get more inventory for a production Okay, amazing insight there. Thank you so much, Chris, for that. So, Abu, I'm coming over to you. And by the way, grinding body parts is not manufacturing. <laughs> uh, Abu, so we're making looking... new. We're making new body parts, and it is manufacturing. Even if we're growing stuff <laughs> to make tissue, it's manufacturing. <laughs> okay, Abu, so we are looking for any examples that you might have, very specific examples in terms of KPIs, um, in description of those, I guess, you know, uh, if people might not understand. Yeah, we're grinding body parts is disassembly, right? So still disassembly. Like See? 
technical people. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, one of the key, I mean, Chris talked a lot about, you know, variance. Uh, and when, when you look at variance, it will drive a lot of things, right? I mean, you look at cost, you look at scheduling. If your cost is too high, that should, you know, start an analysis going and point out a lot of different factors. Uh, one other key factor would be how much did you make, you know, in a predefined time, right? So uh, if you're a chemical manufacturer, you know, are you, how many liters of chemical did you make in a shift, in a batch, uh, in a day? Uh, that's a very key um, component uh, KPI for most industries. Uh, we are doing, uh, re developing a KPI recently for a manufacturing uh, firm, which is, you know, wants to measure how much their packing line is producing every, every shift, right? This is their goal. This is how much they packed. And then they want to uh, measure each and every, how much each uh, personnel packed in, a, in their shift, right? So production efficiency, uh, in my opinion, would be uh, you know, a key KPI, right? What's your planned production and uh, how much did you actually make? And that's where you know, a lot of companies uh, you know, would lose out or you know, uh, would drive a lot of other information that you can further analyze. Um, so in my opinion, uh, cost, you know, tracking cost per unit, per liter, or what, whatever uh, that you're doing, and then how much you are actually making would be the two, like the strongest KPIs that you'd be tracking, in my opinion. Okay, very interesting insights there. So, Abu, I'm going to have slightly more technical ERP like question for you, uh, because sometimes <laughs> when you look at these things, uh, especially from the production manager perspective, even for ERP consultants, these things could be very confusing. When you look at MPS versus forecast versus MRP and what is driving demand and when to use what. So let's say if you were the production manager and you were trying to figure out, okay, should this go as my MPS? So maybe describe these terms a little bit in, and how they sort of affect the production planning. So MPS would be like a master production schedule. Uh, so you're... Your production scheduling is defining how much raw materials that you need, right? Uh, material requirement planning is you're taking an input point of view, you know, how much safety stock you have, how much is getting consumed. So the so two different ways of looking at it and probably trying to get to the same end result, that is uh, to have enough of what is in stock and, um, you know, and you have it when you really need it. Uh, raw mat MRP would be where, you know, you have a lot of movement in the raw materials. Uh, where you know they're not necessarily tried tied to a specific end product uh, that's where you'd be using mrp for those and then uh, mps would be more uh, you know the end product the manufacturing product uh, driven um, this, you know method of planning uh, forecasting then again becomes complicated right forecasting is sales um, you know it can be seasonal forecast you know maybe you're making more during christmas season right you have a, you have a, you're making products which are more suited to that season and then you have a drop in demand you know you're, you're making ice cream for example goes up in summer then slows down so so that would be seasonal forecast again right and then uh, then that can also get affected right so if your sales is running a promotion that is going to affect forecast uh, and then that forecast is going to def uh, define how much you need how much raw material you need and then how much you know uh, end product that you need so uh, you know, at the end, they all they all have their plus and minuses, but you are trying to predict how much you need, how to manufacture, so that you don't have too much inventory sitting, and uh, and you have the raw material when you need to manufacture, right? Essentially. Yeah, great insights. Thank you so much, Abu, for that. Um, Paul, I'm coming over to you. Uh, any KPIs that you want to touch on in slightly more detail? Uh, <laughs> I would, I would, I want to broaden the base and generalize, if you will. I think, I think the key thing is, under, really, understand your what your business actually is, and make sure that any of the data that you're getting uh, is is representative of what you really need, both in source and quality. I mean, those those two things derail more kpi driven uh systems than any that i have seen they just you know there's uh, people try to try to uh collect data in excel and then aggregate on top of that and somebody calls the product one name and somebody calls it a different name 
and the and the data doesn't in fact match what reality is and i would say in terms of kpis uh that's that's the critical element what is the real data that you are looking at and uh you know is is that the is that the data that matter matters for your business and are you actually looking at the real data not things collected at a different level or in a different place and uh you're trying to make this you're making decisions based on bad information it's 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 a universal curse <laughs> So I don't. I, I mean, the 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 KPIs. It, it really all depends on your business. Chemical business is different than a uh, discrete parts business. Is different than a construction business, even if it has manufacturing pieces as part of the the construction. Um, so there can be many, many different kinds of KPIs that are critical for your business. Uh, but make sure that you're going after you you have the real data that you need that's that's uh, important for your business yeah could not agree more figure out what you want to fight for before you start fighting thank you so much paul for that there you go <laughs> <laughs> well said <laughs> uh mike um coming over to you and uh i don't know i mean see if you are going to peel into any specific kpis uh if you have a production manager who's not going to be as smart as you guys uh then you need to break it down for them um so pick uh, a couple of kpis and then just describe them one one of my favorite was when we talked about the, the human factor in, in in making product was always uh um labor cost per part and, and why I looked at that was because you know we, we might make the parts and we made the right number of parts but we, we put more labor on because most of my production labor was hourly so any change in that labor shows up versus on salary you know you get paid for results and if you have to be there 40 hours or 100 hours doesn't matter your check hasn't changed. so what that indicated to me a lot of times why I looked at that very critical or very detailed is why did we run overtime to get this product out? Which can indicate so many other factors underneath. You know, we talked about uh, attendance issues, right? Truancies, right? Did people come up? We talked about um, the utilization of the, 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 the productivity, the efficiency of the person in it. So when I need suddenly 15 hours to make something and I need to bring people in on time and a half, that shows immediately up. That's a very, that's one reason why I liked it. And, and, and I have to say to my own defense, I worked in an environment back then where we had preventative and predictive maintenance. So our downtime really didn't come off the machines because we knew we needed to shut this machine down uh, next Wednesday for four hours to do a spindle change. So master scheduling had that in. So they eliminated or reduced the production plan, which was great because then they weren't surprised. So we would go in, we would have a bi-weekly meeting and tell them this is what our maintenance team goes in. So eliminating that out was one of the first goals. And then the next goal was to li literally work with our labor costs saying, why is that so varying? Is it an attendance issue? Is it a turnover issue? What What is it? Why suddenly the labor cost on this product and you know chris talked about the bill of the material on the on the steps it should take two hours right suddenly labor cost goes up so was it we had to run overtime or was it we suddenly slowed down on, on with the erp and mrp on mes system that i had there were codes in there right on the first code i eliminated when i was a production manager was miscellaneous or all other because guess what? That was my biggest category. It says, no, if I have to put 100 codes in there and I have to give you 100 barcodes to scan the right code, I will do this because all other doesn't tell me what it is. So using my labor cost really was I used it as a driver to find why did things not happen the way we wanted them to happen? Because our machines were really mine. That was a five-year process to get our machine downtime to where we literally could predict this machine out of 168 hours, we have it down for 12 hours because we need to do this, this, and this, and this. Or it was scheduled down because there was no product. So that wasn't a surprise. But the last thing that we went, and I would encourage everybody to look at their 
actual labor hour costs in why does it go up why does it fluctuate for the same processes or for the same because it will indicate you it will drive you to look at underlying costs so that's my my recommendation to a younger or new into the production manager yeah the output you know there are so many variables but if you look at your labor hour, it drives you a lot of times to the to the root cause to the why did we needed more resources than we had because you know your machine sits there that cost doesn't show up as easily as yeah sam has to work uh five ten hour days now without the whip because he's a nice guy he just loves to come in right versus normally he works only 40 hours right so that's for me was always a good good indicator yeah mike and i'll tell you how i work to be honest okay so if you are going to give me a task that is going to take 40 hours okay but i need to have let's say 120 hours even if in reality that is only going to take 40 hours because i have these anxiety issues um, you know 40 <laughs> so i don't know how you handle with that <laughs> with that uh, but yeah i mean uh, i'm probably going to have a little trouble there for you if i'm going to be your resource so dave i'm coming over to you so, so just quick when you have anxiety issues we promote you so we promote you out of the position so where, where your anxiety issues can be utilized for the good. So that's then, what I would do. Then I'm going to be promoted all the time, Mike. Thank you so much. You are so kind. <laughs> promoted to business owner, Sam. <laughs> Absolutely. So so I would like to, to first dissuade the, the thought that Sam only works 40 hours a week. I am 100% convinced just on the times that he and I talk, it, it far surpasses 40 hours a week. Uh, second, I'd like to suggest to Chris that um, th that the the bone uh, the bone sawing podcast or something along that way. Um, I, I think that that could be a new turnkey technologies opportunity right there. I, I look I look for may maybe thirtieth anniversary. I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying. I think there, there's opportunities there for you. I, I kind of want to go to the opposite of, of Mike's comment. Um, one, one talking about KPIs. I think labor and, and understanding labor is really good. I think a really bad KPI API uh, for production managers is just looking at rot capacity utilization of machines, um, unless it is specifically a, a constraint, right? So if it is a constraint, so, so typically in manufacturing, especially if you are in food and beverage, you are filling things, you are almost, that filler is the design constraint, right? Like that should be running as close to 100% of the time as we possibly can. But if we're in another industry, if we're looking at things like a, a palletizer or a depalletizer, that is based upon kind of everything else along the line. If we are in a CNC machine shop, we should be focused on good utilization of the machine as opposed to keeping the machine running at 100% of the time. I see lots of people trying to run machines over and over and over again. And that actually just increases our labor hour, increases our cost. We're probably scrapping a bunch of stuff. And then we're putting a bunch of items and work in progress and in theory and inventory that are costs that we did not need to have. Okay, amazing insights there. Thank you so much, Dave, for that. And Chris, in my opinion, I think you should consider rebranding because you should call yourself Turn Body Technologies. You're always turning bodies. You, you know, it's funny, but the, the complexity in manufacturing, and we've got people doing tissue generation, and we've got multiple customers making medical related products. And a lot of them are their replacement parts, but the guys with the tissue regeneration, it works. But again, you mentioned disassembly, Mike, they bring 70 bodies in the back door and they disassemble. Ooh, that's a touchy one. Hey, what about growing meat? I had another group that grows meat in a, in a manufacturing plant, not animals, but they're growing artificial meat. So manufacturing is a growing. We use the term grow. And I think process versus discrete, right guys? I think that's really the difference here, right? Anyway, okay. but good I mean, stuff. So Closing, closing comments, yeah. you know, find out who owns the KPI. I think that's something we didn't talk about. Who really owns that? Meaning when it goes awry, who owns it? Yeah. Who can impact it? Because the production manager, I got to call somebody. Because if there's 10 of them and he's watching, hey, hey, I got a red one, who owns it? But I think establishing that on the front end is important so that if something does go awry, we know what the actual outcome is. That's me. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Chris. So we are probably going to do a couple of words. Uh, Abu, closing advice, please. Um, I think based on your industry, you know, identifying the right KPI for your uh, production environment and then cracking it and as Chris said, assigning responsibility and having that feedback loop in place uh, to keep on measuring it. Love it. Thank you so much. Paul, a uh, few words, please. Oh, 
I'll go with one word. Yeah, please. Think. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, Mike, a uh, few words, please. Um, Chris took mine to understand who owns the KPI, but let's say um, if a KPI doesn't change, go out and find out why it doesn't change. If it stays static, something is wrong. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Mike. Dave, please. Being a production manager is as much of an art as it is a science. Learn to balance the man and the machine. Love it. Thank you so much, guys. So that's it for today. If you joined for the first time, this was part of our digital transformation series for which we meet every Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We might have some breaks in between, I guess. I don't know if we are meeting next week, but most likely we are going to be here one of the Thursdays. So make sure you check us out. On that note, thanks, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Thanks, group. Take, take care, gentlemen. Good Bye. seeing you all. Thank you, Good everyone. information. Thanks for sharing. Thanks.